It's the e-commerce master plan podcast here to help you solve your marketing problems and grow your e-commerce business. Cutting through the hype to bring you inspiration and advice from the e-commerce sector and beyond. Here's your host, Chloe Thomas. Hello, welcome to our latest podcast. I'm Chloe and it's great to have you listening. In today's episode, we're talking with a business who have appeared on Shark Tank, got Oprah's endorsement and sell across their own site, Amazon and a wholesale retail network. We're going to be discussing brand, product development and a lot of marketing tips. Now, without the sponsors, the podcast wouldn't be possible. So let's take a moment to hear from them before we get started. This episode is brought to you by SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. SendPro Online makes it easy to save time and money, no matter what you send or ship, and you'll always get the best rates and never overpay. With SendPro, you can compare shipping rates between carriers, plus save five cents a letter and up to 40% off USPS priority mail shipping. As a listener, you can get a free 30-day trial and a free £10 scale, but only when you visit pb.com forward slash masterplan. That's pb dot com forward slash master plan. And now to introduce today's special guest. Monica Ferguson is the co-founder at The Soulmates. After inventing The Soulmates heel cap in 2012, which keeps your heels from sinking into the grass, they developed the first natural brand of women's shoe and foot care. They now have wholesale distribution to 10,000 stores in the US, including CVS, the US equivalent of Boots, and LK Bennett, and have strong growth with seven-digit sales. Hello, Monica. Hello, Chloe. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you on. Now, I've just given the listeners a very quick overview of you and the business, but how did you get started off in e-commerce? You know, we got started off in e-commerce in a pretty straightforward way. We hired a website company to build us a website. Um, And we initially, I would say, made a lot of mistakes. So we hired a brand that would really build us a site and run it for us. And we took care of all the marketing and advertising and and everything else we could think of. But we any changes had to be made to the website, any management of it, we relied on a third party. After about a year of that, we realized we'd made the wrong call. Um, we didn't know a thing about web development or e-com really at the time, but we saw a lot of our business was certainly there and going to continue to be there. And so we decided it was time for us to become experts in the field. And so we looked around to find the best um, the best website provider that could allow us ease and accessibility, but also some flexibility in developing the best website for us. Um, and really, it's one that we could manage ourselves, one that didn't involve a lot of coding that we'd have to write ourselves, but one that was simple, you know, developed just for a, a small business such as ours. And so it was a pretty short path that led us to using a Shopify site. I had a feeling you were going to say Shopify. I said, I think I know where this one's going. <laughs> Very cool. It, it made our life so much easier. Edits to the website are so easy to do. There's no third party involved. There's no paying someone to do things that are easy enough to do ourselves. I mean, we joked that on our very first website, we asked the designer to change the font. And he said, okay, I can do that. It'll take about two weeks. And we thought to ourselves, there's got to be a better way. Like, is he carving this in stone? Like, it, it, it seems intellectually that it should be easier to do. But it, we kind of made the decision when we started, like, we're not going to become experts in things that we don't need to be an expert in. Like, we'll find the best people to do certain things. Not appreciating that this was one of those things that we kind of needed to be the expert in before we could show someone else how to do it. And in order to stay on the forefront of, you know, connecting our website to our social media and having an even time to our Amazon store, just having everything work together was something only we could really be responsible for. But I think there's there's still an element of outsourcing it to an expert when you're on a website which you can do something on because you're relying on the software provider to do all the difficult stuff. Absolutely. So you can get on with the trading and the merchandising and the marketing of it. There's still a lot of outsourcing going on there. But yeah, the whole um, sending an email and hoping the font gets changed in two weeks time. Oh, thank goodness those days are behind us. Yes. I mean, even adding a new product was was difficult to do before instead of being something that could take about three minutes. Um, and we still have someone who works for us who is an expert in, um, I guess, who's our tech expert. And so when we want to make a big shift to our platform, he can help us with that. 
um, and help us with formatting things, help us with things that go a little bit beyond the plug and play of Shopify. Um, he knows how to tweak the systems, how to you know optimize our plugins, and really is sort of like a best of breed um, for us to be working with. And so we, we we don't pretend that we are the experts in it, but we're much more um, seasoned in it than I think we ever thought we'd be. There is that bit of becoming a, a clever buyer, isn't there? There's a certain amount of lay knowledge that's required to make the right decision. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you know what, what did we. If we didn't understand how everything worked on the, the back end, the extent that there's a back end of the Shopify site, it's pretty rudimentary um, or elementary, I should say. Um, we would have a harder time knowing what we can and can't do. Given we're talking Shopify, we better talk plugins. So are there any particular plugins that, that you'd like to rave about for the audience? You know, I almost want to pull open my Shopify so I can look at <laughs> the dozens that I have because I feel like it's not fair <laughs> to only talk about the one that comes top of mind, not even realizing some of the, some, so many that work that I don't even realize I'm using. That's the crazy thing about it, isn't it? You, there's the plugins, sometimes the plugins, which are the best are the ones you forget you even have because they're that good. They just disappear. I was helping my nieces set up their own little Shopify site for a small business. They're trying to start. And I realized how very basic the basic Shopify is and how without all the plugins I have, the site would be a very different story. Um, I mean, for us, because we do, because we have an in-house warehouse, our ship station plugin is crucial because it, you know, shipping so easy. Um, we use Active Campaign for our email. So Active Campaign is always working with um, SumoMe. So SumoMe is our pop-up, that collects email addresses and then sends them all to Active Campaign. Store Locator is a pretty good one because it keeps us on top of all the, it's really more helpful for our customers because they can always find a store nearby. Um, one thing we added more recently was, um, a talk to live chat. It's spelled T-A-W-K, somewhat like talk, which the Americans should appreciate especially. <laughs> um, but, um, it's a great, it was something we actually asked for years ago for on our website. We're like, you know, we, people hate to call. No one wants to call and people don't even like generating emails. They just want to be able to be on the site and have that window pop up and say, do you need help? Or click on the window and say, I need help it makes getting your questions answered so much easier. And so we wanted that. And I think a few years ago, we were told it was going to be, you know, five to $10,000 in four months of development work. <laughs> um, whereas the talk to is a three minute plugin. And all of a sudden customers can jump in anytime they have a question about size or fit or how long something will take to come and what the difference is between products A, B, and C. It's just so easy. And you mentioned you've got a, a guy who helps you with some of the techie stuff. Who else is on your team? And are they in-house or are they outsourced, freelancer? What, what's it looking like? Well, um, between my the co-founder and myself, we also have someone who does our marketing um, who's in-house. We have a graphic artist who is, she's officially freelance, but we like to think that she only works for us. <laughs> <laughs> Tech support. And then in our warehouse, we have, depending on the time of year, between like three and six people working on shipping products and getting things ready for stores. Nice. So pretty much in-house is the way you, you play it. It's a, it's a pretty nice balance, but yes. And between you and your co-founder, how do you go about divvying up the jobs? Because that can be a real challenge as things grow. Yes, it can be a real challenge. And it continues to be something that we try to be fluent in what each other does, at least I like to think she's flint in what I do and I can stay clear of things she does. <laughs> um, but I like to, I, I really manage or what I like to, what we like to think about it is that I manage what customers see when they're shopping on their phones or on their computers. And she manages the experience of the brick and mortar. So she is managing all the logistics of products getting from our supplier to our warehouse, to the stores. And I'm managing the digital space of what the customer experience is on our website or Amazon. And you say your website and Amazon, are they both equally important ch sales channels for you at the moment? Oh, don't I wish. There, there was a time a few years ago when they were 50-50. And before that, of course, it was you know 90-10. But these days, um, Amazon does dominate a pretty significant part of our digital revenue. Um, and we will just we can we will see that continue to grow. Our website has, you know, a, a strong role. And we're proud of the role it plays and we'll always continue to play that role of customers to know that we exist outside of Amazon, to know that we're a real brand, to know that we're not just a fly-by-night pop-up with a couple of you know product listings on Amazon, to find there's a real backbone to the company and learn more about the brand story and just get a, a stronger sense for all of the products that we carry and the, the history of the brand and the, the celebrities that use a product and the press we've received. Um, Amazon is like a soundbite of all those things, a, a, a very valuable soundbite. But the website sales are, are very small compared to Amazon's. 
But yeah, it, it's one of those challenges, isn't it? It's like you want people to get that full brand experience, but if the customer wants to buy on the marketplace, the customer wants to buy on the marketplace. We realized that a few years ago when we were looking at our keyword searches on Google, which was you know always a really important part of our marketing strategy is you know what we're bidding on certain keywords, which, which everyone does. Um, and we, we just saw the traffic wasn't really growing. Like the number of people searching for our product didn't seem to be growing as it had in the past. And then we looked over at Amazon and you can do some keyword searches on Amazon. Um, they're third party websites that provide this information. And it was, I think it was four times as many people were looking on Amazon for our brand and our products and our keywords than they were on Google. And now it's something like eight times. It's just, there's just no comparison. That's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. And it, you know, it's scary. But it's a great unknown, but it also like all unknowns and changes, it creates great opportunities. And so for, for a brand like ours, you know, we started out with this heel cap, this invention that came out of nowhere that prevented women's heels from sinking into the grass. It was cool and innovative and there was nothing like it. And once we had it out there, it was out there and that was great. And people were coming to our website, finding us, seeing us in storage, recognizing us, all wonderful things. But then the question becomes like, well, what's next? And so we launched another product and put it on our website. But the problem is getting a second product to get a lot of awareness when it's not just a small tweak off the first product is really hard and really expensive. And it's hard to drive traffic to a website to a product that people don't know they need. When you're brand new and you can get, you know, anyone's attention for media, it's much easier. But once you start adding, you know, product two and three and four, customers don't know you offer two and three and four unless they're looking for product one. And maybe they just want product one. It's hard to get people to want more. But when you're on Amazon, because of the algorithms, because of the way one can advertise, because of the way that products are grouped, it's a lot easier to add new products than it ever was before. So do you think that if the Amazon option didn't exist, you would do less product development? Is it that bigger bigger change? Um, I think we would do product development more slowly if it weren't for Amazon. I would like to think all the products would still exist. Um, our revenues are, you know, our net revenues would certainly be higher <laughs> if there were no Amazon. Um, but the top line that they provide can't really be beat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, I know it's, a, it's something which a lot of our listeners juggle with or, or try and work out is how much time, how far do you let the marketplace go? And it's like, well, at the end of the day, you have to listen to the customer. If that's where the customer wants to buy, that is where the customer wants to buy. But you, you mentioned that celebrity endorsements and PR have been hugely important to the business. Is that as, as much today as it was back when you first launched? No, no. When we first launched, the PR and the celebrities wearing it were, you know, the lifeblood. It was how people were learning about the product. I mean, it's hard to beat having Oprah wear your product and then call it genius and put it in her magazine. Uh, Or having Carrie Underwood wear them on stage when she performs just because they provide more stability. Demi Lovato wore them while singing the national anthem at our World Series, which is a, a highly watched experience in the United States. And it, it's so cool. At the same time, the double, the flip side of that Demi Lovato wearing them in the grass is that you really have to look for them to see them. <laughs> <laughs> because they're pretty unnoticeable. It, it's the, the Oprah and the general magazine and um, influencer press and exposure goes a lot further. It's when we're promoting the fact that celebrities are wearing them that we can you know, help kind of drive that point in. But in the beginning, that was everything. That's how people are learning about it. That's how people are saying, okay, I'll try that. Today, we definitely depend on those things a, a lot less. Um, because we've been around a little bit more. So now we're spending more effort really on our own advertising and social media. So getting our Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest ads, really getting them right. Um, and, you know, we spend obviously lots of time and money getting them right all the time. So it's, it's a, it, the ball is always moving and the strategy is always changing as to what works. It's, but the, the celebrity and the PR piece at the beginning was great to make people realize that A, this was a problem that could be solved and B, here was the solution to that problem. Absolutely. The PR in the beginning to let people know that this was a problem and this was a solution were crucial. Hmm. And um, what do you think is the most awesome thing about your business right now? The, I think the most fun part about our business is that with every product we create, there's this sort of the, the moment of the light bulb going off. And like, oh, there should be this. And the fact that we've developed um, a network of suppliers and a, a team of people that we can create products. Like it's a really cool 
feeling to think that you can bring things into the world, into the marketplace. Like, you know, neither of us have kids yet. And so it's this idea that we can sort of create these things from nothing. Um, and that's kind of cool. I'm sure we've got a lot of listeners who've come up with maybe one idea or who are still trying to get the first idea. But how much more difficult was the second product idea after the first one? You know, it's funny because we debate what our second product was because neither of us can fully remember which one, which it was. Uh, we have a product that prevents blisters. It's called a blister blocker that's about to launch in several different styles because it's been so crazy successful. Uh, and then we also have this antibacterial spray called Freshen or Refresher that um, destroys bacteria in shoes that prevents them from smelling. And actually, it smells like baby powder. And it's amazing. When people try the Refresher, they will not go without it. Half of my friends who do indoor cycling carry it in their bags with them. And these are men who carry this like little clear bottle with pink writing. Um, and they love the product. Um, my business part, my co-founder is a giant athlete, or I should say giant athlete. She's a, she's a really competitive athlete, very petite woman, but a very competitive athlete. Um, and she has a product with her spraying her cycling helmet, her shoes, her gear, because it, the product works so well and it's all natural. And I think, you know, we created these natural products because it was something we wanted, not because we were trying to, you know, be in touch with the movement. Like, you know, want products to use on our own bodies that we feel good about. And we don't want to sell something into the world that we don't feel good about. And so we, we don't know which one came first, the refresher or the blister blocker. But I, both products were really born out of dialogue that we were ha- conversations we would have between ourselves. Kind of like, what, what do you need? What is your biggest frustration with shoes? Is what do you need? And no one wants blisters and no one wants shoes that smell. So which one, which one came second is still, still up in the air. <laughs> but, but it really, it's all been born out of personal necessity, things that we want and need. We've had so many, so we've had, you know, our suppliers are awesome, um, but they also come from a position of they make products that they want people to buy, like we all do. And so often they would say, you know, this is a home run, like this product X, if you rebrand this, you're going to kill it. And we would look at it and be like, well, it's just not something I've ever thought I needed. It's just not a problem I've ever experienced. I don't feel comfortable trying to sell something that I can't genuinely say, you need this. Um, and so we've kept our product line pretty lean on purpose because we've never wanted to um, flood people with products that we didn't think they needed if we didn't need. So it's as important what you choose not to develop as it is what you choose to develop then? Yeah, I, I think our product line could probably be have three times as many SKUs at this point if we listen to every single suggestion we've been given. And I'm not saying that we've definitely been right in turning a lot down, but we just really felt like the integrity of the brand, especially in these early days, is paramount. And being able to say, we use all these products and we need all these products. And without them, our life would be a little bit you know, less comfortable or our shoes would be dirtier. It just, it feels better to, to, to love everything we sell. And you mentioned the importance of the brand there. Is that something which kind of you knew the brand identity from day one, or is it something that's evolved over time for you? I would say internally, literally meaning inside of our minds, we knew the brand identity. Our ability to articulate it took some time. And that was probably another mistake on our part that we did not flush out the brand identity prior to launching the brand, which, you know, as we're both MBAs, we really should have known better that we should have created the brand identity and then launched products into that. But life is not always as clean as, as a business school case. And so we really, we, we launched the product based on what we knew and liked and knew people could connect with and knew because it is a, a, there's an emotional connection to the product as ridiculous as that might sound for a piece of plastic. But something that goes on a high-heeled shoe, when you, whether or not you're at a wedding, a graduation, you know, God forbid, a funeral, or walking down a city street, something that goes on your heel that makes you feel better, that makes you feel more stable, that gives you more confidence to stand up straight, to maybe walk with a little more confidence, um, it, it's, a, it's a mood changer. Like It's a mood-altering product. It makes you feel better. And, and when you feel better, you look better. You, know, you stand a little bit taller. You just feel better about yourself. And our product has that ability. Like you're, you're a woman who's uncomfortable in her own shoes at a wedding does, will never look beautiful. Like she'll, you'll never feel beautiful if you're um, balancing on the tips of your toes or trying to find a rock to stand on at a wedding reception. And I reference a rock because I have a distinct memory of myself standing on a rock at a wedding reception and being like, how can I get to my table? <laughs> <laughs> Without doing that strange little on the toes walk thing. 
And, and I think someone had recently handed me a pretty full glass of champagne. And I was like, you know, I don't want to look like I'm drunk. I don't want to be like you know, switching this glass back and forth, but it's really hard to walk with, with no stability in a pair of high heeled shoes. And so the fact that we've, you know, bridged that gap and people can feel better about themselves um, is the essence of the brand. So we now say regularly, Soulmates is geared to make women, uh, make everyone feel that, feel more comfortable in their own shoes. Um, and so with a statement like that, it's a lot easier to create more products that accomplish that goal. E-commerce master plan is supported by some of the greatest companies in the e-commerce sector. Here's a reminder of who they are. Shipping is complex. Now there's a better way to manage it all. Send Pro Online by Pitney Bowes. Easily compare USPS and other shipping options, print labels and stamps on your own printer, track all shipments. Plus, despite the USPS post rates increase in January, you'll still get great discounts on USPS priority mail shipping and get five cents off every letter you send. Sempro Online is only $14.99 per month. You can get a free 30-day trial when you visit pb.com forward slash master plan plus a free £10 scale. That's pb.com slash master plan. It's time for the top tips round. Okay, I love this section because it gives me and our listeners some really quick ideas for taking our businesses to the next level. So Monica, first up is the book top tip. If everyone listening to this podcast agrees to take Friday off and read a book to make their business better, which book would you recommend? Ooh, well, I didn't read it, but I did listen to it. I feel the need to disclose that because I, I now own a hard copy of it because I loved it so much. And it is a bias towards my business a little bit, but it's Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog. It is the story of Nike, but it's the story of any brand and any company that goes from nothing to everything and really how all these little stories and setbacks and challenges and life along the way um, help create a business. Excellent one. Okay, the traffic top tip. Which marketing method do you either prize above all others or think doesn't get the press it deserves? Again, my answer is a bit biased based on a lot of my brand's traffic originating in the wedding industry. Um, and because a lot of women planning weddings, planning outdoor weddings, think about their high heels, Pinterest has been an amazing feeder of ours and one that we can, I don't want to say manipulate, but we can use to our benefit in a way that other sources don't, don't generate the same level of traffic that Pinterest can for us. Pinterest only gets mentioned very infrequently on the podcast, but when it does, those who mention it rave about it. It's, it's clearly kind of like a mysterious box that once you've unlocked it, it's all powerful. All powerful. You know, we first learned about Pinterest looking at our Google traffic. And genuinely, we were like, pin, pin Pinterest? Pin, pin, like we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't even know what it was. And then we learned and we're like, wait, what are they doing? And people are going onto our website and pinning images from our website onto Pinterest. And so we're like, wait, this is so cool. And the advertising only came in the last couple of years. I don't, I can't say the ROI is positive, especially in a world dominated by Amazon, but it was positive before Amazon took over. But we see the spend on Pinterest that, that does raise all ships. That does raise that, that tide raises all ships. Nice. Okay. Then the tool top tip, maybe a collaboration tool, a social media plugin, a phone app, or just a way of working. Is there a cool little tool you use that makes you and your team more efficient from day to day? So I have two that I really like, and I don't, um, two that are helpful, um, two that can do the job that people can do and they do it really automatically. One is called kit, uh, K I T it's a plugin, um, on Shopify and on Facebook that sometimes she's a little bit annoying because she texts me all the time <laughs> and she'll text me to say, um, I see a spike in traffic. Uh, let's retarget. Or do you want to start a campaign for X, Y, and Z? How does this campaign look for you? She's jet, she's creating marketing campaigns for me automatically based on what people are looking at on my website and then either retargeting or starting a whole new marketing campaigns. Nice. And the second one? Uh, Clickly. Um, Clickly, I don't think has is nearly as popular, but it is a free retargeting campaign. So Clickly is it's one of those annoying little websites that follows customers around the internet. Um, but it only I only get charged when someone actually transacts, not just when they click. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Not heard of that one before, so I shall have to go and check it out myself. Yeah, it's, it's relatively new. I don't know how well they're doing outside of my enjoyment of them, but I, I do think it's a 
good little service. Cool. Okay, the growth top tip. If you met someone today who's focused on growing their e-commerce business from 100 orders per month to 1,000, what would be your number one tip for them? Um, I would tell them, depending on the space they're in, to, to focus on the influencers in their market. I know that might seem like a, a tried and true or a tried method, but when we focus on influencers, those who can genuinely connect to our brand and those who seem to have a genuine following, they they can move the market for us in, little by little. And so if you reach out to 100 influencers and you get 10 of them to plug you, you know, maybe one of those 10 will have real followers and they can help move the needle. You know, people pay attention to them. Like, you know, don't don't try to compete with the ones who have a million followers, but find a sweet spot between, you know, maybe 10 and 50,000 followers because they're looking for brands, they're looking for business, they're looking to negotiate. Um, they want content and you have content for them. So, you know, try to find a place where you can um, meet influencers that are going to help your brand. Excellent. Okay. Well, Monica, before we say goodbye, would you like to let the listeners know where they can find you and your business on the web and social media, please? Uh, Chloe, I absolutely would. Soulmates' website is thesoulmates.com. If you sign up on our website, you get a 10% discount. Um, or Amazon, we're soulmates everywhere. Any any iteration of soulmates, God willing, will bring you to some of our products. Um, we're also sold in CVS pharmacies around the USA, DSW stores in the US and Canada, um, and LK Bennett in the US and hopefully in Europe soon. Excellent. Very cool. Well, look, Monica, thank you so much for being on the e-commerce master plan podcast. It's been a pleasure having you on and chatting away to you. So um, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Thanks so much, Chloe. It's been my pleasure. Excellent set of advice there for any of you working on product dev or looking for ways to get your brand new products in front of the market and a good, good few marketing tips in there too. To get your hands on the notes from today's show, including the top tips, links and details of related episodes, then do head over to ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find a link to this show and everything else in there. If you're particularly interested in in, uh, Pinterest, you will also find our chat with a Pinterest expert on that page too. If you're listening via Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please do give us some feedback via their review app. It'll help more people find us and the more people we can help, the happier I will be. I hope you have a great week and don't forget to keep optimizing. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce master plan podcast. Find out more at ecommercemasterplan.com slash podcast.